So I did take a bit of a minute or two to refill my beverage, make it in a much larger glass, and I was looking over the footage, and my god, we are cracking three hours, and I'm not even halfway through my list, so I'm not trying to rush the process, you know, I'm hopefully you are enjoying this as much as I am, cheers to that. But I will say, I'm going to try and not spend as much time on the rest of the films, for efficiency's sake. So I'm not exporting like a six hour project, but you know, I'm loving this as much as you guys are, and hopefully, I'm really enjoying talking about the films that have created me into being this passionate individual that I am, so I'm going to try and speed things up just a slight bit, but also give every film the time it deserves. And starting that off, we have 2014's Godzilla, Godzilla, Godzilla. Now, this film was a big surprise to me. I remember watching this and having a lot of fun, but I very distinctly remember everybody talking about the lack of the title character in the film itself. And to that, I would agree. This really was a risk, not having Godzilla in the film very much, and even more so, the film marketed as having Brian Cranston as the main character. Yet, spoiler alert, the movie's been out for almost 10 years. I feel like I get spoiled a little bit. The Brian Cranston's character as the father dies within the first third of the film, and you're left with Aaron Taylor Johnson and Elizabeth Olsen as this husband and wife. But really, I think if it wasn't for the writing giving a lot of care to these humans in this insane situation, I wouldn't nearly love it as much as I do. It was the beginning of the MonsterVerse, and I think it's very fascinating to see where the trajectory of that has changed from different directors and visions. This one is by far the most grounded, and I have a lot of fun with it. I still think um, Skull Island is the best out of all of them, but they're great. It's a great time, so check it out if you haven't, and it's always interesting to see that where Elizabeth Olsen and Aaron Taylor Johnson kind of pair together before they became Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver for a very short time for Quicksilver, which I will not talk about. And the next is another David Fincher film. We just talked about his uh, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, but this movie is also terrific. Gone Girl, starring Ben Affleck and Rosamund Pike. And this really is about a husband that is put under scrutiny and a lot of criticism as he is the prime suspect when his wife suddenly disappears, vanishes. But you soon realize that it isn't just a missing case and you don't know if the man is entirely innocent and you don't know the whereabouts of this woman until the narrative unfolds in a way that will make you sick to your stomach but is a one-of-a-kind experience and this edition comes with a book of the wife's Amy. she is like an artist but when you watch the film it's amazing amy tattletale that's the book. And when you watch the movie and you figure out why that book matters so much, it kind of shifts everything into a position where you understand it by the end. It's a great time. And speaking of times, we have the Safdie Brothers' Good Time. This comes right before the one of the most intense experiences I've ever had with Uncut Gems, but a good time. It was 2017. And was actually the inspiration for Matt Reeves, the director of the Batman, to cast Robert Pattinson as the Caped Crusader. So, thank you for this film. But it stars two brothers, played by Robert Pattinson and a Benny Safdie, one of the brothers who directed the film as well. And Benny Safdie plays Nick, I believe his name is. Yeah, Nick. And he is special needs, and when they go to rob a bank, it goes horribly wrong and Nick ends up getting arrested, so it's up to Connie, played by Robert Pattinson, to go save his brother while also maintaining the cash, and it is full adrenaline, it's hyper close-up shots, really kind of an immense invoking of that claustrophobia and that race against the clock. It is a fantastic film. I've been to New York a couple times, so I can't really comment, but it portrays New York in a very realistic manner and light which I also think has heavily influenced because a lot of the actors in this film are real life people. So you see individuals operating certain businesses and that's them, that is really just them, hospital nurses, um, pawn shop owners, and that translates heavily into Uncut Gems. But Good Time is a great movie 
one of my favorite in terms of just pure thrill escape. You can't get any better than that. So, good time. Next up, we have a very big surprise to me, which is Goosebumps. Not the R.L. Stein like show, but the Jack Black film. And I believe this is directed, and I have a point to this, it is directed by Robert Letterman. Yes, okay. So this man, I got this movie again, there's probably, maybe not, there used to be a sticker on here that indicated that I bought this from a rental store for like five bucks. And it is so much fun. And this is directed by the man who went on to make Detective Pikachu, which these both share similarities, which is you do not expect them to be as good as they are. And I think it just comes down to the care that all of the people involved, the screenwriters, the director, the producers, everyone has for the source material. And Goosebumps growing up were stories to me. Like, I wasn't able to fully allow myself, as because my parents wouldn't let me, to watch horror films, so I would look to Goosebumps. And to this day, there's some that are very cheesy, but a lot of them hold up, especially the books. And this film really capitalizes on that whilst also being very fun, a great Halloween watch. It has Dylan Minnette right there, with, no, right there, I was right, and Jack Black bodies the role as R.L. Stein. It's so good. I have so much fun with it. The second, I have not seen, but yeah, it's really movies like that, which I will always go support because it's the kind of movie that you could just tell there's so much passion put into it, but that's Goosebumps. Next, we have, sorry, there's a piece of lint right there, or buzz, uh, Green Book, the 2018 Oscar-winning Best Picture film with Viggo Mortensen and Mahershala Ali. Now, it is very much a white savior film, and if you don't know what that means, that's basically a narrative where people of color, typically a black person, is uplifted out of their situation or found to persevere by the help of a white person. And it's a trope that has been riddled throughout Oscar buzz for years. Um, I think the biggest offender of this is The Blind Side. And while this movie isn't entirely that, it is very wholesome. It is based on a true story. And I think the difference between something like The Blind Side and Green Book is at least Green Book boasts an incredible cast of characters. Um, Viggo Mortensen is just transcendent as this man. He's essentially like a pig. And Marshall Ali is this very prodigious musician that the Green Book was this book that was designated for black people to go to these hotels and places that allowed colored folks to stay. And you follow Viggo Mortensen as he helps Marshall Ali travel around the country touring his music. And it is very wholesome. It's very sweet. And although, like I said, it is more of a white savior film that's riddled with Oscar buzz. I still very much enjoy it, and I think the two leads have such incredible chemistry together. And if you've never seen it, I suggest checking it out. Mahershala Ali, I believe, won the Oscar again for a supporting actor. That'd be his second win, because his first was in Moonlight. And it shows. It's really good. Check it out. <laughs> Next, another green film, The Green Hornet. <laughs> I enjoy this movie. I do. I think it doesn't take itself seriously while also kind of taking itself seriously. It's goofy. It's very cheesy. It's funny to me because it's directed by the man who made Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind, which I, I, I don't get how they kind of coincide. I know that this movie, um, and you can mistake me and correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember there was an original like idea or a script for this film that was a lot darker. Um, but this is most definitely not that. It is goofy. It is, like, laughable at moments. But J. Chow and Seth Rogen are really good as Kato, and I forget the other guy's name. But it's fun. I enjoy it. It's a goofy time. I mean, Christoph Waltz plays a guy named, like, Chefsnowski, and he has a gun that has, two, it's like two pistols fused to one. It's kind of everything you need to know about the movie itself. It's, it's a good time, though. So, if you haven't seen Green Hornet, I recommend it. It isn't great. It isn't for everyone. But, you know, if that's kind of something you're into, then check it out. And I'm going to put these films on my shelf. Okay. I'm trying to be as quiet as possible. Sorry, I know. But it helps me a lot. So, the next 
next we have The Gray. Now this is a film starring Liam Neeson as a individual who is amongst, I want to say like a dozen, who crash in the Alaskan mountains and they have to fend for their life as they have to, you know, stay warm, find food, shelter, but most importantly, protect themselves from very hungry wolves. And I've been wanting to watch this movie for a very long time now, and I kind of bit the bullet and I bought an Amazon, or I believe an eBay copy, for like five bucks. And this is not only Liam Neeson's greatest film, it is, without question, one of the most bitter atmospheric and downright unnerving watches there has been little movies that have made me fear honest creatures animals like a wolf to the level that the gray has whether it be through practical puppeteering or cgi this film invokes a sense of dread and intensity as these men have to kind of find a way to survive also a confrontation of the things that you think you can escape because you have all the time in the world and Liam Neeson is wonderful in this movie this is directed by Joe Carnahan and he's gone on to make a lot of smaller films all of which are just fun or have something to say and I would say this is easily his darkest work but man oh man I cannot stress and I would love to talk and make a video about it during uh, winter time because I think it is the perfect winter watch. It's bitter, frigid, cold in tone and literal aesthetic, but it is it is a thrilling watch. Very difficult to digest though. So check it out though. The Greys, muy bien. Now next I have a sealed copy of the 4K Guardians of the Galaxy 2. This I got off of, um, like, I had some Disney movie rewards. I was like, hell yeah, I can buy Guardians 2. This, to this day, is still my favorite MCU film of all time, truthfully. I think because of James Gunn's heart and a way to make you fall in love with these characters that are so oddballish, yet very down-to-earth in their drive and persistence. But it's the ending where Yondu sacrifices himself and it has one of the greatest lines that and I and I remember seeing this movie for the first time and I didn't connect with it. I saw it. I remember when they just kind of started introducing reclining seats and I watched the movie and I enjoyed it. I didn't love it. And then I saw it again and something just so profoundly potent clicked with me in that watch and Maybe it was because of just that idea of finding your family in people that aren't just related by blood, but having the film end on this very, not somber, but rejoiceful note towards, you know, life after death and how death can bring a family together instead of a climactic battle. It was really heartwarming for me. And I cry. I father and son, or yeah, father and son by Cat Stevens is to this day one of my favorite pieces of music ever made. So having that play at the very end, my God, iconic. So check it out. Now jumping into the H's, we have the Hateful Eight, directed by Quentin Tarantino. Now Quentin Tarantino is a director that I thoroughly enjoy a lot of his movies. Hateful Eight was one of the first at an age when I saw it. I actually kind of connected to it uh, in terms of how I enjoyed it. And this film boasts an incredible cast from Samuel Jackson, Walter, Walton Goggins, uh, Tim Roth, K Kurt Russell. I, I, I try not to look. <laughs> Just so many people. And they're stuck in this cabin for, I believe, like maybe like two days a day. And these are a vast range of characters. And these are characters nonetheless. But it gets very intense, very crazy, very quickly, while also maintaining a, like, black, dark comedy that, wow, it is a lot of fun. It has an incredible score by Anino Morricone. Anino Morricone, I don't know how to pronounce his name. He did a lot of the westerns with uh, Sergio Leone films, and it is, it is a thrill to experience. It is, I would argue, maybe Quentin Tarantino's 
most contained film because his movies really kind of span multiple locations, multiple ideas, and The Hateful Eight condenses that into one cabin, but with characters that, wow, wow, <laughs> it's crazy. You need to check it out, though. Next up, we have, I'm going to get a lot of, a lot of heat for this. Heat, a film that I've never seen. Striked by Michael Mann. I talked earlier about Collateral. That's one of my favorite movies of all time. It depicts L.A. in a very vibrant sense that I don't think any medium has done better. Maybe he could have beat himself beforehand. I don't know. I have yet to see this. It's like three hours long, and, you know, it has Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Val Kilmer. It is a classic from what I hear and my dad having grown up in LA just always talks about how wonderful that movie is and you need to check it out the shootout scene is a classic and I will I will one day I promise next up we have Hell or High Water this is a sort of western neo-western um robbery film but at its core it is two brothers that kind of will fight for their lives for each other as the world that they're kind of consuming themselves in is starting to become so much more modern and with that they are making it's making their job much more hard and you have jeff bridges as the sheriff who tracks them down and it is a white knuckled experience through and through both chris pine and ben foster are wonderful the cinematography is so beautiful there's a moment in the film where they're at a gas station and i want to say it's either before or after something major happens and there's this kind of group that's next to them talking about you know just how wild these two brothers look and slashes out and chris pine's character just completely goes a wall but the way it's shot really kind of just showcases everything you need to know about the movie i love it i love it i cannot recommend the film enough next in terms of recommendations is the scariest film i've ever seen that is only beat by another film i'm going to talk about soon by ari aster's hereditary hereditary since its release has garnered a lot of attention deservedly so it is a trip into really what death grief and the turmoil that all of that invokes has on a family unit seeing how that kind of is extracted amongst every member and turned into whatever this is i i'm trying not to spoil the film because it talks so much about a lot trauma abuse anger revenge and there's moments in this movie that will forever be I, you know, when I first watched the film, I sat in my room, and it was like 3 in the morning, and I had to pee really freaking badly, but I couldn't because I was so petrified by the end of it. Yeah, I, you need to watch it. You need, at least if you're a horror fan, you have to at least check it out once. If it's not for you, then it's not for you, but just give it a shot. <laughs> Next up, we have the three How to Train Your Dragon films. We have the first one second and the third these films i think the first one is the greatest it is a classic it was a truly transformative moment for me as a child growing up i loved them so much dreamers really was on a level of their own with these films and i think even though the second and third aren't as good they're both really kind of helping to create a trilogy that is rather coherent and cohesive within all three of the movies. They have a similar tone, thematic elements, and animation that's beautiful. DreamWorks doesn't always hit, but when they do, they really freaking hit. So, yeah, if you've never seen How to Train Your Dragon, I would question your sanity. I don't know what you're doing, and I'm so sorry for your childhood if you never saw it, because these are classic. So next we have another Dollar Tree film, The Hunger Games Catching Fire, and if you look closely, it is also in French. It 
that's so funny to me but i got this at the dollar tree i used to be a big fan of the hunger games films when they came out you know 2012 and for the few years that followed catching fire mocking jay you know that that was really the height of the ya adaptations but i still think these are the best catching fire is still an excellent film there is so much i love about this movie and it really comes down to the commitment and the love the love and there being not a lack of source material adaptation it really is from book to film and there's some changes but i think it's for the better narratively because the visual medium and the reading that you do is vastly different but i love this movie i would love to give them a rewatch i have actually not seen mocking j part two because from 2012 to 2015 my you know interest changed the first part one was very slow but yeah i, I would love to rewatch them sometime so if you've never seen them i don't know what you're doing next we have the imitation game the imitation game This film is set within the winter of 1952. I'm reading the synopsis. As British authorities entered the home of mathematician, cryptana, cryptanologist, cryptanology, cryptana, crypt analyst, God, and warrior Alan Turing to investigate reported burglary, they instead ended up arresting Turing himself on charges of gross indecency on an accusation that would lead to his devastating for the criminal offense of homosexuality. Little did officials know they were actually incriminating the pioneer of modern-day computing. Again, this is such a sad, sad film. As, again, like I said, in the synopsis, Alan Turing is a homosexual man. He is a lover of so much of the, 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 the code that goes into what we would call today as computing, but he also has to deal with his homosexuality. And I think it, it is tough. It is very tough, but it is a very worthy watch for just his performance alone. Kira Knightley is wonderful in everything she's in. And another, again, another 2014 film that I can't recommend enough. Next up, we have In Time, Justin Timberlake, The Currency is Time very unique concept with not the best execution but still a lot of fun if you haven't seen it i recommend it you know it it, it doesn't take itself entirely seriously at parts but i really do feel like this concept is sort of reduced to a lot of surface level one note decisions made by characters off of impulse and it doesn't really go anywhere by the end but i can't under uh, understate how great the concept is like the currency of it being time is so badass if you've never seen it justin timberlake is great there's a scene revolving him and his mother which actually gets me very freaking emotional if you could just watch that scene out of context it's fantastic again like i said there's so many great moments but it's sort of undercut by the one-dimensional character decisions but check it out and next we have the Incredible Hulk. So, I want to say this was like the first film that we ever bought when we had a Blu-ray player. Um, not much to say. Edward Norton. You know, for so long I complained that Edward Norton was like the weak link in the film and that's why he didn't come back. But if you look at the behind the scenes, you know, he looks very invested in the character himself. And to the point where it looks like he's directing the film and not the director himself. It's wild. I think the film has a lot of promise. The score is great. It's very bombastic. The CGI isn't terrible. And seeing how the MCU's Hulk has evolved or lack thereof, I very am much on the side of this Hulk. I love him. I love the barbaric beast-like qualities that he invokes and abomination is not a great villain whatsoever but it's abomination it's a skeletal creature that matches hulk's energy it's a lot of fun um definitely ranks probably the lowest on my mcu ranking just because it doesn't have any 
connection aside from the end cameo with Robert Downey. But that's it. Next up we have The Incredibles. Truthfully, a classic on all levels. I love this movie so much. Brad Bird has proven himself time and time again with live action animated films. It, when I rewatch it as I get older, you can tell like the film is a movie in an animated format and it was the first time, and I'm not trying to dock any of the other animated films that exist, but the way that it's shot and it conveys storytelling, I think has only ever been perfected by Ratatouille. And it feels like the camera itself is there. It is an asset rather than, you know, just motionless. Uh, the story is fantastic. Like, it's very dark. I think people forget that the whole ball is put in motion when the superheroes are kind of outcasted and made illegal. When a man sues Mr. Incredible for not letting him die. Oh my god. That is just such a wild concept that I think about routinely. It's a lot of fun. It's just a shame that the sequel that we waited 14 years for... Yeah, 14 wasn't very good. Um, again, that is a conversation for another day, but yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of it. Next we have Indiana Jones, the collection one, two, three, and four. I love the Indiana Jones films, minus the fourth one, but I really do want to give that one a rewatch. Um, these are all just a globe-trotting adventure. I love the Indiana Jones films. They are really just awesome examples of stunt work, action, and storytelling on a level that was really early for Steven Spielberg, but works. I love them. They're so much fun. If you've never seen them, I don't know what you're doing. Um, there's just certain fundamental films that you kind of have to have just seen. Don't worry. I've fallen victim to it. I have not seen Godfather. A lot of people would just absolutely shoot me down for it but indiana jones is a lot of fun if you've never seen it maybe you suggest checking it out almost slipped i suggest checking it out again these films are like all so much fun i think ultimately like my favorite would have to be the third because of sean connery as the father but each of them are very different in terms of the adventures that indiana jones goes on so Check it out. And Harrison Ford is great. I love Harrison Ford. Next up, we have Disney Pixar's Inside Out. So, hold on. I thought that the disc was loose. That's like, oh, I make my heart strong. Inside Out is, to me, and it's funny because when I watch this film, the idea of there being emotions in your head as these characters that roam, core memories, train of thought, all of these ideas in this movie... I think are some of the most original ever created and it has grown on me so much as time has progressed from Giacchino's score to Pete Docter's direction, the animation style, to really just the story at large. It is one of the most original and it just makes me so happy and giddy with the biggest smile on my face every time. It is a classic and it just gets better with every watch. The colors, the mood, the atmosphere, the storytelling really is there, man. I think Pete Doctor can do no wrong. Next up, we have, and I think, no, that was 2015. Next up, we have The Internship. So The Internship isn't the greatest comedy of all time. In fact, it kind of falls in line with that, like, stupid schlock. But Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn, Wedding Crashers, these guys are just unbeatable. And this film means a lot to me personally, and it's funny because I think I'm going to try and open it with being as quiet as possible. These films are really, yeah, it, I watched it at a very important time in my life. Um, and I was going through a lot at a very young age. I was 10 when this film came out. But just because of the association that I have to the time period, this film, and I saw it with my dad, it meant more to me than I think he even realizes to the point where I've co collected my AMC stub for when I saw it. Uh, yeah, in 2013, it looks brand new because I've tried to keep it in the best condition possible. Damn, matinee was $7. That's crazy. Yeah. 
um it's, it really is moments like these where you look at this like to think that this piece of paper was printed almost 10 years ago i was 10 years old i'm almost going to be 20 that's kind of that's that's it's a wild like full circle thing and seeing that i'm making a video about a movie about movies that have touched my life in a way that i could have not mad like fathomed but here we are i don't know it's kind of freaking me out but yeah it's a good time it's about these two uh, best friends who are kind of not really understanding the current landscape of technology in this generation so they apply to work at google and as a result they kind of begin to experience that they're a bit behind the curve but it's a lot of fun i i have a great time yeah it's vince vaughn owen wilson these guys these guys are awesome these guys are great so check it out next we have I was 11. This film changed my life. I really cannot begin to comprehend how beautiful this film is. Made for 165 or $200 million. It is gorgeous. It is a film that never ceases to make me bawl my eyes out. And honestly, after this, I really can't say Nolan has ever gone back to that root of emotional tie. I adore Tenet. I own it. I've seen it multiple times. I think it is his most technically perfect movie. But the emotion in Interstellar rivals any film ever made, truthfully speaking. I love it. Oh my god, Matthew McConaughey. Although, I think, yeah, Eddie Redmayne won for his performance as Stephen Hawking. Deserved. But I will say, if, if Matthew McConaughey were to ever win, it would should have been for that movie. It's, it's, it's wow. Next, we have The Invisible Man, directed by Lee Whannell, starring Elizabeth Moss. This was the last film I saw before the pandemic. And I think it is one of the greatest horror films of the 21st century. I think the way that it uses the modern era and its asset and the way that it works in terms of a narrative device wow i think elizabeth moss is terrific there's so much that the movie says and it's based off of this invisible man character that i the movie has no right being as sophisticated as, as it is while also letting loose and having fun i love it so much if you've never seen it i believe it is on hbo it is a treat to behold and I can't stress how good it is. Now next we have The Invitation. Now The Invitation is a film that I saw years ago. And it's about this couple that get invited to this other couple's housewarming party, so to speak. And everyone sort of knows each other from high school. So they're coming back together after years of distance. And you begin to figure out that there's a lot more behind the scenes than meets the eye. And you uncover this all through the couples and their kind of relationship with one another. But realistically, it gets crazy. But I love the film because it was the first time as a young viewer of film and really trying to realize that I could make these that bottled films meaning films that are set within one location like financially are very easy to make but it relies on a very good script to keep the audience engaged because you can look at different sets and production designs to keep you somewhat engaged but when it's all within one location wow that is a whole different beast to embody and i love it Again, it's the kind of movie that you will never forget, well, at least for me, when I first saw it. And I think that kind of speaks for itself on its own. Now, next is a film that I grew up watching. Absolutely loved as a young kid. And I really don't think I would be the same without it. <laughs> and that is I, Robot. I, Robot stars Will Smith and is taking place in the year 2035 and basically he has to race against the machines and 
2006, 2005, regardless, it came out many years before that sort of AI taking, taking control, excuse me, taking control idea in a story was as popular as it is. So, yeah, I think it's so much fun. I distinctly remember the film, <laughs> the product placement for Converse was so heavy in the opening, and it never... No movie has ever made me crave sweet potato pie more than iRobot. I love it. The the special effects for the robots and voiced by Alan Tudyk, who is a voice actor for a lot, really lends itself to some wonderful scenes. It's cheesy. It's goofy. The ending is questionable. And when you kind of equate the fact that like it is from a book that is a lot more sophisticated than what we got, kind of diminishes it. But if you take it for what it is, it's a lot of fun. Again, another futuristic film, The Island, directed by Michael Bay. And basically it stars Ewan McGregor and Scarlett Johansson, who live on this island. And they live out their days kind of in pure isolation on a compound. And they, they realize very quickly that they're clones. And they're here to basically like live out and once their expiration date is over that's when more clones of them are made now it is very cheesy but it does kind of offer to me what i think is lacking in aside from ambulance which is michael bay really can handle action in a way that can be invoking of a lot when it doesn't rely on explosions and quick cut editing to weigh it down so so much fun you can definitely tell it was written by men because Scarlett Johansson is very much over-sexualized a lot. And she's like, you know, the deer in headlights. Ewan McGregor is the savior. And it, it's very goofy, but it's a lot of fun as well. And nobody really seems to talk about it in Michael Bay's filmography. Next, I have It Chapter 1 with like this lenticular cover. This lenticular cover. It for me, I'm really glad it exists because it is, to me, the only film that in the horror genre was made on the budget it was, but also got the amount of reception it did. I have a lot of fun with the first one. I really have been lately wanting to rewatch the sequel because it's like two and a half hours long and it isn't a horror film as much as it is like almost a sci-fi film. And the sheer existence of it and its sequel blow me away. It shouldn't work. And some of it doesn't, especially in the sequel. But the fact that alone that they made as much money as they did, the first it was like a freaking phenomenon. And I, I just love it and commend it for the fact that they freaking exist. They're like massive budget horror films that really kind of just inspire me as someone who's always wanted to make a horror film. The first it, Bill Skarsgård eats it up and all the characters, and especially their adult actors, are, wow, so good. Check it out. Now next we have a much smaller horror film by A24 called It Comes at Night, directed by Trey Edward Schultz, who then would go on making one of my all-time favorite films. This movie is a lot more um tell rather than show but in a way that keeps you engaged it doesn't kind of cheat you out of a payoff because you realize what people are trying to escape might just in fact be themselves and it starts Joel Edgerton oh man I I do love this movie it when I first saw it kind of left me disappointed when I initially finished it but I realized that's kind of the point because then in that frustration you're trying to solve why and what you're missing but in doing so you realize that there's so much more of the film to appreciate so it comes at night check it out it's like a post-apocalyptic slow burn small budget film I, I love it I love it next up we have the two John Wick films I don't own the first one I film landscape they don't really quite do them like this 
I think they're blasts. I really do love the first one because it not only was the first within the franchise and it has so much emotion to it, but it really did was what inspired all of the other films outside of just John Wick, like Nobody, uh, Atomic Blonde, Bullet Train, a lot of these action heavy films from the art style to the production to the fight choreography. And Keanu Reeves put himself on the map in a way that none of the other films that he's ever done, I think, has. And it proved that the man can still kick ass. The stories are constantly engaging through the visual and literal storytelling narratives to sense. I love it. I love all three of them. The third one, I think, has the best action, but the first is the best story-wise. So if you've never seen John Wick films, man, you're missing out. They're so much fun. So much ass. So, yeah. And then next on the list is Jojo Rabbit. Jojo Rabbit is a Taika Waititi film about the Holocaust. It is a dark comedy while also being a drama while never using the Holocaust, a very tragic event, as the butt of a joke. It highlights the absurdity and the nonsensical nature for which the dictator who, you know, Adolf Hitler propagated so much of what happened and what led to the destruction and death of millions, but it also has such a beautiful, tender heart to itself, and the movie is only, what, two hours long, less than that, and in such time, you become in love with the family, with this little boy, this kid, I swear to you, Roman Griffin Davis, one of the best child performances, period, and it needs to be. It is so, so beautiful, and I cannot tell you of a movie that has, in one moment, me rolling over laughing, and in the other, me bawling my eyes out. Seriously, check it out. Next, we have Joker. I'm not going to talk much about this movie. Um, Lawrence Sher shoots the hell out of it. The score for the movie is haunting. Joaquin Phoenix is fantastic. Film bros have kind of ruined it for me, and I won't even lie. It is an amazing. It's really good. I love what it symbolizes for comic book storytelling, and I think the success of a rated R comic book film, I wouldn't say superhero because Joker isn't a superhero, but a rated R $50 million grossing $1 billion budget movie is incredible, crazy, and I, I think without it, we maybe not had Batman or all of these original stories being told. It's awesome. Next, we have Joy. Now, Joy is such a fun little movie to me. It tells the story of the woman who invented the Joy Mop. Now, that might sound very boring, but it's directed by David O. Russell, and this man knows how to create an engaging story from nothing. It has Scarlett, no, not Scarlett Johansson, that's, sorry, Scarlett Johansson looks, and, and Jennifer Lawrence kind of looks similar in this picture, I apologize, so sorry Jennifer Lawrence, if you're watching this, I love you, and if you're watching this, Scarlett Johansson, I also love you, but this movie is so much fun, it's hilarious, it's absurd, because the story and how she created the Joy Mob and her family with her dad played by Robert De Niro is nothing short of wacky, I love it. Like it says, it is a must-see out of all the David O. Russell films that I've seen. The Fighters, Silver Linings, Playbook, American Hustle. This would probably be at the bottom, but it's still so good. If you haven't seen it, check it out. And then finally in this pile, we have The Judge, starring Robert Downey Jr. and Robert Duvall as father and son. And when Robert Downey Jr.'s character is told that his father is dying, he kind of has to confront the fact that his father wasn't the greatest to him, that his father prioritized his work being a lawyer over his son, and that his son has largely consumed himself in that same footstep pattern. And in that, there is a court case that kind of unravels revolving around the father, but he has dementia, so he can't testify for himself, and he isn't the same man that he was. And you have this back and forth relationship that is very damaged. But when I say Robert Downey Jr. eats every moment he is in up, this film is so, so good. I love it. I love it. It has Vincent D'Onofrio and I believe Jeremy Strong from 
from Succession. I could be wrong about that, though. Um, regardless, though, this is an actor's film, meaning it is a script written for actors of such a high pedigree to perform, and I, I love it. It does have some, like, Hallmark cheese moments, but it has, like, a 41% on something on Rotten Tomatoes, which is not deserved whatsoever, if I do say so myself. It's so whack that it has that rating. But yeah, so we just finished that pile, and I think I'm going to get up to about letter M, okay? And then that's when I'm going to stop this video, and it's already so long as it is. Take a break. I've talked about movies for hours, but we still have the letter J to get through, and, you know, J, K, L, M, when we get to M, that's when I'll stop. The next up, we have 21 and 22 Jump Street, two of my favorite comedies, directed by Christopher Miller and Phil Lord. I think I finally got that right, Christopher. Yes, I learned from Glide with Jens Meatballs, but that comes me to my point. Having these directors make, literally, this is like their lineup. 2010, Glide with, or 2009, 2010, Glide with Jens Meatballs. 2012, 21 Jump Street, 2014, 22 Jump Street, and the Lego Movie. What? Oh man, these guys are so massively talented, and Channing Tatum and Jonah Hill really have some of the greatest chemistry in any comedy that I've ever seen. They're just so much fun. You guys need to check it out. Next, we have Jumper, a very underrated small. 90 minutes film starring Hayden Christensen, the man, Darth Vader himself, as he is this man with an ability. He can jump into any part of the world that he sees visually, and when Samuel Jackson's character tries to defeat him for no apparent reason, I, I think maybe they talk about it in one or two lines, that's when the race to protect himself happens. Now, I will say, this film is very stupid, but it is in a way that it doesn't make any bones about it, and I think the fact that it is 80 minutes solidifies itself as peak, because if it was two hours long, I feel like it would have overstayed its welcome, but it's there for the exact amount of time it needs to be. The action is so much fun, because then he finds that he has other people that are around the world that are like them, and these jumpers can jump vehicles, anything that they're touching, and it leads to very great inventive action sequences. I actually kind of wish it was a little longer, but seriously, it's so much fun, and it's crazy because there's a third disc for a digital copy back when, before, it was like a paper that you could type in a code. It's a lot of fun, though. Check it out. Now, next on my list is the Steelbook of Jurassic. This is one of my favorite steelbooks, as they used to have like this sort of additions for many films, where it's like in a comic book panel, and it's so cool. This film is one of my all-time favorites. I think it stands the test of time, from the effects to what they did for making a life-size T-Rex, but the movie itself is just masterfully done. Steven Spielberg is the legend for a reason, and this being the film that kind of pioneered that is so deserved. If you've never seen Jurassic Park, and I say this about a lot of movies, but yeah, I think also what's funny to me is when you watch a film like Jurassic World and you realize it's in the same franchise as this, this is much more of like a disposable summer film that I still have a lot of fun with, but this is masterfully executed filmmaking and storytelling with an emotional core to itself that I love. Not to say that this film is void of emotion, but I'm just saying, like, when you look at the films back to back and you kind of realize, like, damn, why is the franchise kind of being reduced to just B-budget schlock? And it, I'm not saying it's B-budget in its presentation, but more in where the film prioritizes action and blockbuster fun over characters that are engaging. I am looking forward to Dominion, though. But yeah, I think it's just worth a conversation or something to note. Now, next.
next on my list. <laughs> Such a random jump. But we have Keanu leading the K list. This stars Key, Key Michael Key and Jordan Peele. Kian Peele. <laughs> um, this was kind of their film debut as they wrote, I believe, the, yeah, they wrote the film, or at least Jordan Peele wrote it. And <laughs> it's about these best friends that like get their cat kidnapped or catnapped and they go on this revenge <laughs> story trying to retrieve their cat i bought this at the dollar tree i have no regrets though it is so much fun it's very stupid but it's the kind of movie that you crack open a couple guava nectars and you sit back and just offload it's so good i've had a blast with it i've only seen it once though you gotta know the kind of movie you're going into with a premise like that. If you've never seen it, check it out. Next up, we have probably my favorite steel book in my collection, which is Kick Ass. Now, I got this on Black Friday, and it has a slipcover, which is rare. Oh, it just like falls out like butter. I'm not gonna make it fall. I'm not gonna make it fall. I refuse to make it fall. <laughs> The slipcover kind of just adds to like some of the artwork, but the freaking steel book itself is just beautiful. So you have um, Kick Ass, Hit Girl, and oh, I forget, a oh, Big Daddy, <laughs> played by Nicolas Cage. And then on the back, you have um, I forget what their name is, but I know the actors Christopher Mintz Blasi and his dad in the film, played by Mark Strong. And you open it up, and it's the disc art, and you get some background, but you get like little cards. They're really freaking cool, and it gives like stats with like a quote of them. It's really cool. But Kick Ass, over the years, I saw it when I was in like 2010, and I was under like probably the age of eight. So when I watched it, I felt like a rebel. I never understood any of it, but a movie called Kick Ass that was all I needed to know for my like eight year old self to think that I was the craziest kid alive to watch something like that. But with all seriousness, it is a film that holds up remarkably well. It feels like a comic book put to a movie form, and it makes sense given the fact that it's directed by Matthew Vaughn, who would go on to do the Kingsman films, and then before then would do X-Men First Class. He knows the comic book medium more than a lot of people, and it shows. I love the film so much. It has this edge to itself. It's, it's so good. You guys need to check it out. Next, we have a film that I bought blindly called The Kids Are Alright, starring Mark Ruffalo, Julianne Moore, and it, I've never seen it. It looks great. It looks like the kind of movie I would love that's just, you know, something you can, like, lightly, casually sink your teeth into. So, I've never seen it, though. So I can't really tell you whether or not it's great. So next, we have two films. We have the 1930s, God, I think it's 1930s. 1933, that was right. King Kong, it is a digi book. I love this edition so much because it includes imagery from the film posters, behind the scenes, and it really is a work of art given the fact that it was made in 1933. It is a lot of fun. It is very short. Um, but seriously, this movie kind of is hard to like imagine. But it set so many aspiring filmmakers at the time and that generation and what to come for film. But then I also have the 2006 Peter Jackson King Kong, which I love. This film is so much fun. I watched the extended edition, which is three hours and 20 minutes, 200 minutes long. But this is literally from the guy that made the Lord of the Rings films with that budget, you know, and anywhere he could go, he decided to make King Kong. And I love King Kong so much. Naomi Watts is so good. I love Jack Black, Adrian Brody. It has a world in and of itself, whether it be through Skull Island. I forget if that's like actually what it's called. It's called Skull Island. I'm basing that off of um, the 2017 film, but... I'm gonna, I'm, gonna keep, I'm gonna think it's Skull Island. It's so good. The attention to detail from the costuming all around is a blast, and the relationship. 
relationship that King Kong and Naomi Watts' character have is beautiful. I do cry by the end. It is, oh, it's so good. Next, we have Ryan Johnson's Knives Out. Knives Out is a, like, whodunit thriller set within the confines of practically just This is one of the best Thanksgiving films as you get your family to watch a movie that they already have seen, most likely. But it's within the thrill of watching all this cast, whether it be Ana de Armas, Chris Evans, Jamie Lee Curtis. I love to test myself, that's why I'm not looking. Tony Collette, Michael Shannon, Daniel Craig, Lakeith Stanfield. All of these freaking actors working at the top of their game, just having fun, letting loose. It's so perfectly written. There's this whole monologue that Daniel Craig's character as the detective goes on about donut holes. Yes, donut holes. It's insane to believe, but it's a blast. You guys need, need to watch it. It's so good. thing to that. 
I love musicals, and I think it's because of this movie that I do. Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone are electrifying in this. It is so, so beautiful. The music, the cinematography, the direction, the, the vibrancy and adoration for L.A., but at the same time, it isn't a love letter to the city more as it is a love letter to dreamers. I needed that film so much, and I'm not sad that it didn't win Best Picture because Moonlight deserved it, but it got all the recognition it deserved in my head and in my heart. Um, as someone who's hoped to one day live in L.A., it was the exact thing I needed to see at the time. So check it out. Next, we have The Last Black Man in San Francisco. I saw this movie once. It has some of my favorite cinematography in any movie. And as it is really a love letter to, I want to say, yeah, just uh, Oakland specifically and the architecture of the place itself. But it stars Jonathan Majors and I forget, oh my goodness, the main actor's name. He is so good, so good. But this film is so gorgeous. It's soft. It's, its story is sweet and simple. But in itself, it's a movie that just wraps you like a warm hug and never lets go. You should always check movies out like this. They're so, so beautiful. Now, in a bit of a less beautiful, <laughs> a bit of a less beautiful way, we have The Lighthouse, directed by Robert Eggers. This movie is a descent into madness. Two fishermen, or two lighthouse keepers, who are uh, basically just away together lose their minds. Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson are, wow, I'm telling you these two dudes kissed many times during the making of this movie. I swear the amount of sexual tension that is in this film between the two of these guys is crazy. Seriously though, I think this was a film that I needed when it came out. And one second. A24 is so well known for making films and they don't make them but they finance them but I think that's enough and because the money is what makes the movies and these movies like La Lighthouse rarely come and when it's there you need to take it while you can check it out like I was saying talking about Lady Bird Little Women is one of the sweetest films I have ever watched with Emma Watson, Florence Pugh, Sheer Ronan, and I'm forgetting one of the big ones, uh, Laura Dern, Timothy Chalamet, Meryl Streep, Eliza Scanlon, everybody in this movie and just radiates comfort and simplicity. That's why period pieces mean so much to me because it doesn't focus on these tangible things such as wealth, money, but it's all about love and what that means. It's so, so beautiful. It's a warm hug that doesn't let go, just like The Last Black Man in San Francisco. It's, oh, it's a treat to watch. The way that Greta Gerwig works with color changing, depending upon the past and the present, is magnificent. Now next, we have James Mangold's Logan. I was just thinking about this movie the other day and how in one movie you get an entire world's worth of emotion. It is Hugh Jackman's best performance. I think his greatest and best is kind of, it's different. I think Prisoners is his greatest, but this is best. And I, I can go in the whole discussion of what the difference between the both of that is. But I think it is the best conclusion to the X-Men franchise that there possibly could have been, and it is a movie that you guys need, need to check out, but you have to have prior knowledge of the X-Men films before it, just to really feel the impact of what happens in this movie. The farm scene where Charles, Logan, and Laura have to pretend to be a family, but they actually are a family the entire time, is the greatest comic book scene I've ever watched in a movie. Check it out. Next, we have <laughs> Logan Lucky, a NASCAR high 
heist film directed by Steven Sodenborough, the man who did the Ocean's 11, 12, and 13 films, having Adam Driver, Kylo Ren himself, be an amputee, and he uses a prosthetic arm. That's all you need to know. Daniel Craig is fantastic. You need to check this movie out. And next up on the list, we have Long Shot. This is a very cute rom-com starring Charlie Theron and Seth Rogen as two very different individuals. <laughs> Basically, Charlie Theron is a t trying to run for presidency while Seth Rogen is a journalist who's a heavy partier, but the two kind of form a bond together after having been almost kind of couples, but they've known each other for so long in high school. And she kind of uses, not uses, but undertakes him as this man that gets to help her within her presidential campaign. And it is, it is really good. It's a lot of fun. It's cute. And if you've never seen it, I strongly recommend it. Check out Longshot. Next movie we have is Looper. Looper is a very much a sort of pseudo set in the near future, but not too heavily in the future, where there's these loopers and they are sent men or people from the future that are committing insane crimes that they kill in the past because there's overpopulation. And then when they close the loop, that is because they killed the man in the future. And it's, it's insane. But then what happens is when Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character is, gets sent himself from the future played by Bruce Willis, things begin to get out of hand. I've always said Looper, another Ryan Johnson film, is without question one of the best futuristic films on a budget. Its story is palpable. I love it. It's intense. Bruce Willis kicks ass in this movie, but Joseph Gordon-Levitt really stuns. The prosthetic makeup he wears to really look like Bruce Willis is crazy good. You guys need to check it out. Next, we have the three Lord of the Rings films. Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, and Return of the King. There's not much that I can say that's already been said. Uh, they're classics for a freaking reason. <laughs> Next, we have The Lost World Jurassic Park. This is the second Jurassic Park movie, and you can already tell it takes a very big decline from the first, but it isn't bad. I don't think it's bad whatsoever. It is Steven Spielberg, but middle-tier Steven Spielberg is still better than so many of the films that are coming out now. Excuse me. And I will argue that the scene between the two T-Rexes trying to take their young out of the RV is on par with the original Jurassic Park uh, T-Rex scene. I like a lot of this movie. Jeff Goldblum is Jeff Goldblum. That's that's a given in every movie he's in. Um, yeah, I enjoy it though. If you've never seen any of the films, I think going in blindly while also knowing that the, the sequels kind of take a dive after the first um, it will suit you best. But yeah, I, I like them. And then rounding off the L's is Love, Simon. Love, Simon is a love story about this young man, Simon, trying to really find himself. And when he realizes that he might be gay, he kind of questions that while also keeping it a secret. But it isn't too much of a secret for certain reasons. And it was so sweet, so sweet. I remember going to see this movie and everyone who bought the ticket knew exactly what kind of movie they were getting into, you know? And, and there's been so many experiences where there's been characters that are gay or queer or part of the LGBTQ. And uh, so many people in the theater just groan or roll their eyes or scoff. But everyone in the theater, and it was a packed theater, knew exactly the movie that they were getting into. Nobody held back the tears. It was, it was a very spiritual experience, to say the least. All right. I do apologize for the time jump slightly. I had to move around a couple of these stacks and refill my beverage, get some more. So I apologize, but we are back. And I felt what better way to do that than to talk about one of my favorite Blu-rays within my collection. And that is the Mad Max Fury Road Steelbook. So this has a bit of a funny story behind it. I saw the movie when it came out and adored it. I made my dad 
stand outside of Best Buy. It was on a school day. I remember I was like in sixth or fifth grade, and I made him stand outside of Best Buy, and they already had sold out. I felt defeated, crushed. He surprised me by ordering it off of eBay, and I think to this day, it might just be my favorite steelbook, if not just because of how great it looks front and back, but also because of the journey it took to get it. I love the film. Should not have been seeing it at the age I did, but it shaped me very much. It is high octane. I love the story behind it as the fact that George Miller, the director, when choosing an editor for the film, his wife has been editing films in Hollywood for years, but nothing like a Fury Road, these action films. So he felt that was the exact reason why she should work on it, and she ended up winning an Oscar for Best Editing. Love that story. Next up, we have another action film, The Magnificent Seven. This is the remake that came out in 2016, 2015, with Denzel Washington, Chris Pratt. Uh, I know Vincent D'Onofrio's in it, Ethan Hawke. God, I wish I could remember these other actors' names. It is a stacked cast, and I've never seen the original Magnificent Seven before, but I can report that this one is a lot of fun. It's just a great time in a dying genre of film. I mean, there's better westerns that have been made within the past few years. I made a video just recently on The Harder They Fall, the James Samuel film. Superb. This is nowhere nearly as good, but it's still a fun time nonetheless. I think with a cast as great as that, you really can't go wrong in a lot of the departments. It's great in, in its own right. Next, though, is a very big departure, which is also probably, I would put up there with like Cloud Atlas and a couple of the movies that we'll talk about later. Magnolia comes from Paul Thomas Anderson, who has been infamous for making such unique stories and get gripping you into worlds and characters so uncanny. And this was his third film, first being uh, Heart Eight, then Boogie Nights, which I don't own, but I wish I did, and then my favorite, Magnolia. It is uh, multiple different characters in their own stories, but all of the narratives find a connective through line by the end. And when I tell you that it is one of the craziest stories that'll wrench your heart open, cut it, and leave it to dry, it is three hours long, and any director in their right mind would never have made this, but Paul Thomas Anderson, at such a young age, right after Boogie Nights tackling the porn industry, uh, does this, and for that, I am indebted to him. Uh, his most recent film, Licorice Pizza, I have a lot of issues with, but it does not undercut the brilliance of this film, and one day I hope to make a video that can do this movie justice. Next, we have another really, really fun film called, and it's funny because the same actor appears in my next movie, The Man from U.N.C.L.E. This was a 2015 spy espionage thriller, and I will never forget the fact that this came out the same year as Spectre, and I think this is five times better than that film. And I'm not trying to play the comparison game, but I just felt like this movie was so unrecognized and still is. It has Army Hammer and uh, Henry Cavill. Now, this is the film that made me realize that Henry Cavill could be the next Bond, and I'd be okay with it. Not my top choice, but it's still up there. It is a blast. It comes from Guy Ritchie. He did Sherlock Holmes, uh, Snatch, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Very much, if you've seen any of those films, very stylized, but he writes the films that he directs, and I don't know if you wrote this one as well. Um, yeah, he, along with a partner of his, wrote this, and it shows. It's very quippy. It's so fun, but it always stays within the time period it is in, and I love this film. It's perhaps his most underrated movie. I love it through and through. Basically, two different spies. One, I believe, is Russian. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, and the other is British, so they're from very different units, and they have the same goal of finding the same person, and there's the love interest, but it's so much fun. Check it out. Now, next up, we have another Henry Cavill film, which I'm desperately wanting to upgrade to 4K, Man of Steel. Now, earlier in part one, I did talk about how Batman vs. Superman is, again, a benchmark project for me to make and, and resemble some of the flair and joy that that movie brings to me in an essay. This film is no exception. It is the start of his trilogy within the DC Extended Universe, and this is a movie that has probably grown on me the most out of all three of those movies. When I saw BVS, 
podcast. I enjoyed it when I saw Man of Steel when it came out. I liked it. Luckily, my parents loved it, and since then has kind of reminded me of the excellence of this movie. There is things that people nitpick beyond belief about Zack Snyder's vision, but he is such a lover of comics and his own iteration of the characters. And I'll never understand why people get so angry that like the massive fights happen in the cities. Like these are gods fighting amongst man. I don't understand really like that gripe. There's a lot of things that I'll never understand, but one thing that I will is how amazing Man of Steel is. It always feels like the thing that the MCU is missing, that the Disney Plus shows are doing pretty well with actually, is making these heroes grounded within a humanistic world, in a world where your kind of thought process and train of thought is upheld because these are people, creatures, aliens from different worlds that prove that we are so insignificant and it tackles them, these questions in spades. I love it. Honestly, I think as time grows, I fall in love more and more with the Zack Snyder trilogy, especially with the Snyder Cut coming out, Snyder Cut being released. shows, if anything, for the last like 20 to 30 minutes, and it isn't 
this heavily dramatic film. In fact, I think the reason why Matt Damon is so well in the movie is because there is moments of comedic elements, and it's just him, so he carries a lot of the majority of the film, and it's a great time. It's Ridley Scott, and he's really starting to make a return for himself. I haven't seen House of Gucci nor The Last Duel, but I've heard amazing things about the second Last Duel, and this film really is fantastic. I love it. It's a great watch. Don't go in for scientific accuracies. Go in for a great time, and you will get that in spades. So, check it out. Next, we have The Master. This is, again, Paul Thomas Anderson, 2012, Joaquin Phoenix, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Amy Adams, an incredible cast, and it deals a lot with um, this, this man, Joaquin Phoenix, I forget what his name is in the film, uh, Freddie Quill, thank you, and he is a World War II veteran who has a lot of mental issues, and he harbors so much emotion because of the war, and he turns to this religious, spiritual family founded by Philip Seymour Hoffman, and he begins to find himself within this community, but in a lot of ways, he outruns a lot of the things that Seymour Hoffman's character confronts him about, and it is quite cultish, but at the same time, it isn't, and I think there's that gray ambiguity that leaves you as the audience very much scratching your head, but I love it. Again, Joaquin Phoenix transcends in every role that he's in, whether it be very light roles or heavy ones such as the Master and the Joker, and he proves just the same in this. There's a moment actually in the back where he goes to prison for something that he does for a little bit, and there's like a freak out sequence where he just has a breakdown, and it was entirely improv by Joaquin Phoenix, but then you get to kind of see how the actors around him react to that, and I think it is a beautiful showcase of acting, um, diving into religious and spiritual alignment, the things that make you keep going as a person. It's a heavy watch. Cannot recommend it enough. Again, Paul Thomas Anderson never fails to really just go full force in a lot of the narratives that he creates. Alright. Now, next are a collection of films that I owe my entire life to, and I would say out of all the movies here, I, yeah, I would probably say it's the most recent narrative endeavor that has, uh, I've needed it more than ever, and that is, I have actually, so, I have The Matrix on 4K, and then I got the collection on Black Friday, this was like 30 bucks, it was originally like a $70 package, but I got The Matrix Trilogy, 1, 2, 3, and 4, Matrix 1, Matrix Reloaded, and then, uh, Resurrections, or, re sorry, Revolutions, and then Resurrections, so, I have always been a massive fan of the first Matrix film. I saw uh, Revolutions and Reloaded, not in that order, but uh, years ago. And of course, they're very, very divisive, more so negatively seen than positively talked about. And I kind of ran with that for a long time. But I've always thought the first Matrix film is a benchmark in filmmaking, in science fiction storytelling, in boundary pushing art. And then when Black Friday happened, I snagged this up, and it was on my shelf for a bit. So I told myself for the longest time, I'm going to rewatch them and start from the beginning to the end, especially when Resurrections was announced and it was going to be released in December. I ended up getting COVID, and it, and it was terrible because it was right before Christmas, and Christmas is a very important time for my family, and everyone had to have their, they had their fun, and I was in my room, and I had a very difficult time in isolation. But then I turned to these films, and when I tell you, my entire being for those two weeks was locked into the Matrix from beginning to end in preparation for Resurrections. That's an understatement to say the least. I owe these films and the Wachowski sisters more than most. Uh, and it's not just these films, it's Cloud Atlas, a film that I'll talk about later, the show that I actually have a poster on my wall for since 8. They tell stories about the fundamentals of human beings and the love and affection that is therefore granted. And I try and wake up with the best intentions about human nature as I possibly can, and they strike that chord so abundantly. The first Matrix, like I said, is a classic, but I realize that the second and third are so profound in their own ways. They're not as tightly wound structurally as the first one, but it never was going to be. The Wachowskis had to 
Resurrections came out. I think it's one of the greatest sequels ever made. I'm just going to have to say it. I, I, I was going to beat around the bush, but why would I do that? It's a waste of my time and energy because truthfully, I adore Resurrections. And I think out of all four of these films, this was the movie that struck me the hardest. I can't get over the fact that the first third of this film is devoted to um, like an examination on trauma on the the outlets provided by that gaslighting um denial literally escapism incarnate and the rest is really just a love letter and you have to know the context i said in my video two of this film that lana wachowski used neo and trinity as a means of coping with the death of her death a uh, dad and mother so that indirectly just helped so much of me love this film and i could go on and on but i got so many other films i cannot recommend all four of these films enough i think it's one of the greatest franchises ever made and the fact that it hasn't been milked to obscenity is so wonderful again and there's also um a collection of anthology animation shorts called the animatrix that i also love i don't own it i would love to though you guys gotta check it out the world of the matrix and it's multimedia games websites it's it's so so incredible all right now starting on this next stack we have another nicholas cage film it's still wrapped i got it at the dollar tree it's like a dvd it has that like the snap that the old dvds used to have called matchstick men another very underrated nicholas cage film as he is a man with heavy ocd and it's like a heist film with one of the best performances by Nicolas Cage, but Sam Rockwell and Alison Lohman. Again, she's from Drag Me to Hell. Fantastic. I adore this movie in so many different ways. I saw it once a long time ago, and I immediately fell in love with it. Really, Nicolas Cage is um, a chameleon in terms of acting. He goes in many different directions and isn't afraid to help young aspiring filmmakers and also contribute to the head haunches of Hollywood and I can't get enough of it. Magic Men is a blast. Another Ridley Scott film which again a chameleon of a director with a chameleon of an actor. Check it out. Next we have The Maze Runner. The first one what I would like to say actually is a really good book to movie adaptation. It's a lot of fun. Dylan O'Brien, one of the most underrated talents in the industry. I really enjoy this film. The action is surprisingly really well handled, and as a trilogy, it's made by one filmmaker with a certain vision in mind, and it works. It pulls through. I have a lot of fun with The Maze Runner. It's fun time. I see it with the friends. You don't even have to read the book in order to really enjoy it. Yeah, it was made during the YA movie, book to movie adaptations, but it works, so check it out. And then next, another book to movie adaptation, which I can maybe pose the argument is the greatest of all time. Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. This movie single-handedly reduces me to an absolute disgusting ball of tears by the end of it. It has, um, oh gosh, Thomas Mann, RJ Kyler, and Olivia Cook all of which are terrific actors in their own rights as Olivia Cook's character gets cancer and you have Earl and oh god I forgot what the main character's name I feel so bad uh, Greg Greg and Earl these are two best friends that have always made like very odd independent movies together short films and they decide to befriend um, Olivia Cook's character and in doing so they strike a very unique relationship and it's their chemistry and the really honestly it feels like a Wes Anderson film with characters I care about which in a lot of Wes Anderson films like I talked about with Fantastic Mr. Fox is my difficulty the style never overshadows or just completely covers character and I think it's one of the wildest experiences you can ever have it's life affirming and again if you like coming of age stories I can't recommend it enough next we have another Dollar Tree pick, and this is an incredible movie called I Melt With You. It stars Thomas uh, Jane, Jeremy Piven, Rob Lowe, oh god, I forget his name, uh, Christian McKay. These are four 
best friends who decide to come together after years of separation in a house, I believe in Malibu, that they rent. And they basically make up for that lost time by drinking, having a lot of fun, and fighting random people. But in so many ways, it goes south very quickly. And they have to confront themselves within each other's inner sanctum of friends. And it's a tough watch because there's a certain moment in the movie that happens that completely changes the friends' uh, dynamic. And there's a pendulum shift that happens. But honestly, within this movie, it has all these A-list actors working in, in, a, in a bottled location. And I can't say all of it lands, but again, I got this for a dollar completely blind. And it really stuck with me for a while. It is very hard in the department of the themes that it chooses to tell. And by the end, you might really not end up liking it because it takes turns that it's, wow, it's like a lot of trigger warnings involved. But if you're willing to take the risk and try very different obscure art, I can't recommend it enough. And it's almost kind of perfect that it was at the Dollar Tree. I'm not saying it's a dollar worthy movie, but I think with films as unique and creatively driven independently, such as I Melt With You, which the title in and of itself is just a trip, it needs to be given the opportunity on streaming services, and it isn't. So check it out. Next, I have a Woody Allen film, Midnight in Paris, starring Owen Wilson. Now, I am not the biggest fan of Woody Allen, but I will say this movie is incredible excuse over the man's insanity, but I will give this film credit that it is one of the most imaginative love letters to dreamers, as it stars a man who really isn't happy within his current position. So when he travels to Paris with his, I believe, fiance or wife and her friends, he strolls the streets of Paris in, at midnight, but that's when all of his favorite artists and visionaries come to life, and he begins to realize what life has to offer by confronting the most renowned painters of all time, like Van Gogh. And I tell you, it is one of the sweetest odes to dreamers, to lovers, and it, it, it's so, so good. Owen Wilson really does things as a performer that I think goes completely unrecognized. And this movie is just oh, so much fun.
this is clocking in at almost nearly three hours. The original version of the film is fantastic in its own right, but the director's cut really opens the door for a lot of narrative devices that just, whew, it is a descent into madness. And I think to me, the greatest thing about this movie is the fact that a lot of what happens that will shock you is take place in broad daylight, which most horror films steer away from. It has Florence Pugh in one of the greatest performances, and Ari Aster captures actors in a way that no other director, let alone in the horror genre, can do. I cannot wait what to see what he does with Disappointments Boulevard with Joaquin Phoenix. Apparently, that's like a four-hour dark comedy, and A24 has been really trying to cut that down. And if they do, so be it. I just pray we get the four-hour director's cut, like with Midsummer, because if it proves anything, you can cut fantastic works into being really great works, but at least give us the full director's vision on the physical release. I love Midsummer, Occult, uh, grief, it's, it's so much. The less you know, the better. Next up, gosh, is yet another A24 film. Minari, starring Steven Yoon. Now, this is about a family that immigrates, a Korean-American family that moves to Arkansas in search of the American dream. And it's this family that begins to find themselves in a completely foreign area. It's one of the softest, quietest narratives that I could have ever seen. And Lee Isaac Chung, the story briefly is that he was this close to quitting Hollywood. He didn't really feel like his presence or his stories were going to be recognized or given the funding to be made. And then when A24 saw the potential in this, it really changed him and it changed everyone in this film's lives. And it really does remind you of the beauty of family so well. I love the film. It's so soft, maybe a bit too soft in the terms of like by the time it ends, you're like, that's it. But I think there isn't a regular three act structure as it is more um, a slice of life within a family's differences and within a completely new terrain for a family and Stephen Yoon. Chef's kiss. Next up on my list is another skateboarding film. And I have to preface this by saying it's within my top five favorite movies of all time. It is a documentary called Minding the Gap, directed by Bing Lau. This follows Bing and his two best friends as you find why they skateboard. And again, the mid-90s very much picks up a lot of those same themes because it isn't just skateboarding for the people who do it so much. It's an escape as movies are for me, as YouTube or whatever your vice is. And this movie, I saw this before I graduated high school, and I can honestly say it was probably the best viewing experience that I needed so much at that time. It's an honest portrayal of the escapes that help and why we escape and the things that are we escaping from. Bing Lao, I believe, was 20 years old when he made this documentary, and it isn't just his friends confronting their demons. It's him as the documentarian confronting his with his familial traumas, and it will have you a mess, a mess. I've seen quite a few documentaries in my lifetime, and this single-handedly is the best time and time again. It shows the power of friendship. It shows an honest portrayal of uh, so much. I'm trying not to spoil it, but I'm telling you, Criterion did an amazing job with releasing this edition. And I, it's on Hulu, I believe, but I can't recommend enough getting the physical edition. Next up, we actually have, <laughs> I cannot afford these, with Mission Impossible 1, Rogue Nation, or no, Ghost Protocol, I'm sorry, and then Rogue Nation. So the first Mission Impossible is probably the most espionage you're gonna get of all of the films. I believe we're at, oh gosh, because that was five, six, seven, or almost at seven because of Dead Reckoning. Uh, and this really is the most like two spies sitting at a table back and forth, hitting like jabs at one another with the guns under the table sort of thing. But it works for the time period. I mean, this was the thing that set off one of the biggest action franchises there is. And Tom Cruise 
Rogers cements himself in this. I love it. I think realistically, it's the one that has the most subtlety within it, but it's so perfect because it opens the door for the bombastic insanity that would ensue. Now, two, I don't like. Three, I think has the best villain, but the side characters and the main plot doesn't really land for me. But that's why jumping into I got this steelbook of Ghost Protocol, a film that has the worst villain, but some of the best side characters, and in a lot of ways did kind of put where the trajectory of the franchise would be on. I think three cemented a landmark back into true to form. And this kind of took that baton and created the formula in a very great way. Brad Bird, this was his first live action film. I mean, that man was right off. He did Incredibles in 04, Ratatouille in 07, and then went to do this. And if, I, I, if I'm trying to think back then, if I saw Ratatouille and then I heard that it was announced that he was directing a Mission Impossible film, I would have been like, you're freaking crazy. But him and Michael Giacchino, excellent. I mean, the British Khalifa scene, practical. And <laughs> it's one of the most iconic moments in action movie history. It isn't my favorite, though. I think Rogue Nation is even better. Um, it keeps with that same theme of continuing the characters that were once there. Simon uh, and Ghost Protocol did introduce, no, was it, no, it was the third one, Benji, right? No, that was the third one. That my mistake. But it really does continue this in a lot of ways, and it introduced one of the best characters with Elsa and Alec Baldwin, I believe, yeah, because I don't remember Alec Baldwin being in the fourth one. But it continues that in so many ways, and it has one of the best set pieces that is so unrecognized, which is the Opera House moment. It really is a white-knuckled moment, and Christopher McQuarrie undertook the direction. And, I mean, Fallout is my favorite. God, can, can you imagine saying the sixth Mission Impossible film is the best? But this film is still so much fun, and it has this cool addition where you get this booklet of all the stunts. It sounds so crispy. It's because I haven't it in a long time. But yeah, like, it goes on kind of talking about, like, the behind the scenes of the stunts. Like, he uses a flute as a gun. I don't know if you see that. But I'm telling you right now, that's the most badass thing you could ever do. I'm just saying. It's, it's, it's a great deal of fun that I cannot recommend enough. And Fallout really is the best out of the franchise within the action, within the espionage and the direction. It doesn't get much better than this. I would argue it is probably one of the best action adventure films ever put to screen. It is shot by Rob Hardy, who is a DP that I admire, and Christopher McQuarrie takes it to new heights with Henry Cavill. It's, it's Henry Cavill. It's, it's great. It's a great deal of fun. Mission Impossible, I'm very excited for Dead Reckoning. In order to make the franchise even more, it makes sense that it's going to be split into two parts. Next up is The Mitchells versus The Machines. I'm not going to talk too much about this as I did make a big deep dive video as to why this movie changed my life. Why this Blu-ray has like an entire extended cut of scenes that we've never seen in the movie that are just hand-drawn. They're not fully rendered animation, but this has over two hours of bonus features. It's practically an entire film school, especially for pre-production in a movie. It is one of the sweetest animated films, not just because the main character, Katie Mitchell, is a queer affirming individual. And I love that so much that it's never like blatantly shown. It just is, but also because she's a film student. It is a, male, a movie made with love and passion throughout. I cannot recommend this film enough. Mitchell's First Machines, check out my video. I posted it about a couple months ago. And everything that I still said there still stands. Check it out. Next, we have a very small film, another Dollar Tree pickup, Mistress America, with Greta Gerwig, directed by Noah Baumbach. I believe these two people are married, and it's funny to me because in 2019, they both kind of were like competing against each other, as Greta directed Little Women, again, a film that I wholeheartedly adore, and Baumbach directed Marriage Story, a film that I love. And this film is a lot more small, about two friends in New York that strike up a very uncanny relationship. It's a brisk 84 minutes, am I right? 
which God knows where that is right now. They promise it's on the way, but there's been so many directors that have just left. But I love the film. It is the pinnacle of a Halloween watch, and I will discuss in length during later, when maybe the September, October time, why Monster House stands the test of time. And it makes sense that Robert Zemeckis and Steven Spielberg produced it. They saw the vision, and the vision is fantastic. Check it out if you haven't. Next up, we have Moonlight. 2016 was a wild year for film. I mean, this and La La Land alone. And of course, we all know what happened at the Oscars. And if you don't, there's a massive mishap where La La Land was announced, but it turned out that it was Moonlight. A mishap like that can only happen once. My God. But honestly, Barry Jank, yeah. Yeah. This film helped me a lot to discover myself and where I stand as a person. It is those first time watches that leave you with a big gaping hole within your chest. And I don't think as a director in a debut, I, I know he did um, a film before, I think, but this was really his feature debut. It gets any better than this. I mean, the way that it splices this one character's life from little to Chiron to black, I believe that's how it was interspliced. And the actors, oh my God, how each of these actors were very different. It wasn't like a boyhood situation where it was the same actor filmed over 20 years. No, three different actors, but they are all, you tell me they're the same person, I'll freaking believe you. It is one of the greatest movies that I've ever watched. The score by, by I believe, Nicholas Brittle. Um, I could be totally wrong by that, though. Yeah, Nicholas Brittle is haunting, but I... Please watch it. A24 rarely misses, and Moonlight is no exception. Next, we have Darren Aronofsky's Mother. One of the weirdest films I've ever seen, hands down. It requires you to understand, research, dissect. If you don't and take it for face value, you can probably have one of the worst experiences ever. It is anxiety inducing without any context. So you can get lost within that. But I really do think with that and Matthew Libatique's DP with the score and the, the set design and Jennifer Lawrence with Javier Bardem, Knowing the context is everything. That's all I will say. Darren Aronofsky is one of the weirdest dudes alive. This movie shows that. Next, we have Nerve. So Nerve really is a film that could have been terrible in all intents and purposes. It is directed by people who are in their 30s or 40s, but I want to talk about them in a second. But it somehow really works, and it holds up. I've seen this before. It basically is revolving around a world where there is an app called Nerve, where you can be a watcher or a player. If you're a watcher, you get to examine these people who are playing, and if you're a player, you get to take dares for money, and they increasingly get bigger and bigger. But it is very freaking scary how true to real life it is, and I think it makes sense given the fact that I believe it was directed by one of the two creators of the show Catfish. Um... Or, or one of like, it's Henry Juiced and Ariel Shulman. I know they had involvement in the, it's the brother of the creator of Catfish. These guys are very much in line with knowing where the shift in uh, modern technology and the generation that is Gen Z goes to. And I think with Catfish, a show that I don't really watch too much, it had its pulse on an idea that I think has flourished and this film does as well. It is fun, it's breezy, but it's also made with a lot of care, and I really enjoy it. Check it out. Next is probably, if not for Game Night, my favorite comedy of all time, The Nice Guys, directed by Shane Black, set within the 70s as um, Ryan Gosling plays a detective, I believe, and uh, Crow plays a hitman, and they have to work together to help solve a mystery that is quite absurd and it gets even wackier but it really comes down to the script it has to me one of the greatest ideas and fully committed worlds in any comedy i think a lot of the excuse within the comedy genre is the but the uh, writing and actors within their ad-libbing 
guys with Shane Black's script and direction really lends itself to one of the best chemistries between leads while also just having honestly the funniest ideas put to screen. Check it out. Next up is probably one of the most recent watches I've had where nine days and okay so let me let me let me just tell you about this plot real quick. So nine days is set within a world before you're born where Winston Duke plays basically the man that dictates whether or not your soul is worthy of being possessed into an unborn body. And you have nine days to examine the lives of other people within a house. And you take notes as these people on earth, what you're interested in, what you associate with, what you feel. And through that, you are decided to whether or not you are going to be sent to earth. That idea alone, simply put, is something that I will forever think about. It's the kind of movie such as Inside Out that will change the way that you think about day-to-day -day life, about the structures and institutions which we have taken for granted. I cannot stress the weightiness of this movie. Nine Days is a small film, budget-wise. I haven't heard really anybody talk about this, but I'm here to tell you, like, there is A-list actors, Benedict Wong, Gauzy Beats, Bill Skarsgård, all these people have started Million, Winston Duke, Black Panther, Doctor Strange, It, Joker. But I can tell that each of these actors were chomping at the bit to be in this film because of the idea conceptually alone. My gods, it is incredible. Check it out. I'm not kidding when I say it's one of the most unique narratives that you can ever watch. Next up, we have 99 Homes. A pulse-pounding thriller starring Andrew Garfield, Michael Shannon, as Michael Shannon is the man who basically evicts houses, and Andrew Garfield and his family are one of the members within the houses that get evicted, and instead of completely feeling defeated, Andrew Garfield takes advantage of that and proves to Michael Shannon that he is worthy of being within his business, but there's a lot more than that. It's a very small tightly wound story that'll rope you in within its concept and I think it's stories like these that need to be told. Wonderful film. Very intense though. Next, we have honestly one of the biggest shocks to me. No Time to Die. This was the last Daniel Craig Bond film after reports have said that he was done, that he was moving on, and then this film came out. Two and a half hours. It is one of the best Daniel Craig Bond films without question. I think my favorite still is Skyfall, but I would put it right below. It is shot incredibly well, composed by Hans Zimmer, directed by uh, Kerry Joji Fukunaga, and I will say, hearing recently what a lot of people have been involved within Fukunaga's life have come out and said against him has been very heartbreaking to hear because he is a visionary man. And I cannot stress how great this movie is. I was reduced to tears. One of the best experiences theatrically last year. I'm very glad that it was able to get released. Top Gun Maverick was single-handedly the one that's been pushed back the most by COVID, this being the second, and the product was worth it. Next, we have Now You See Me, and Now You See Me Too. Now, there is a big difference in quality for me. I think the first is sizably better than the second, but each of them are a lot of fun. I think just the story of magicians kind of rousing an audience and the way that the kind of story unfolds in both films, honestly, is a lot of fun. I will say the ending of the first one is really freaking goofy, but regardless, it's it's a great deal of fun. I will choose the first one very much more over the second, but there's still a lot of fun, and Daniel Radcliffe in every movie he's in is just a treat to behold. I think if you've never seen them, they're a lot of fun, with or without your friends. It's a multi-million dollar budget magician heist film. There is like gold written all over it. Does it reach that full potential? Not really, but it's still a lot of fun. Next, we have a film that I'm not going to talk too much about because I'm not going to try and get this uh, video demonetized. Um, I won't even say the title, but um, yeah, Lars von Trier, if you know anything about the man, one of the most 
most out there filmmakers and I do love these films it doesn't feel like overt soft core corn it's not actually I, I'm abbreviating the word but it actually is a story to tell and it's oh god it's so hard to watch I won't even lie to you and these are the director's cuts and together they're like five hours long or five and a half hours long she's Louise but I love the films not because of the surface level takeaways but more really Charlotte Gainsbourg as the main actress in the film and the, the, the depths that the story gets into thematically I should not have seen the movie when I did but I'm glad that I own it and if you're willing to take a leap within film check it out next we have Oblivion now this is directed by Joseph Kaczynski starring Tom Cruise and I actually saw this film in New York I took a trip back in 2013 and I saw it in a massive theater and loved it I think it doesn't hold up nearly as well it is a bit more style over substance but it's still a very great film nonetheless Tom Cruise gives it his all it's visually exciting to the minds I cannot stress to you and it makes sense because Joseph Kaczynski did Tron Legacy then this and now he's doing Top Gun Maverick he started his work as a VFX artist and then moved on into filmmaking and that makes total sense the visuals in this movie are bar none some of the best and there's a score by M83 which I can't sell enough is fantastic it's a lot of fun the movie does seem to be a little bit more deep than it actually is but regardless it's it's a great deal of fun check it out if you haven't again kind of different from what Tom Cruise would typically do next we have the Oceans 11 12 13 and the original Oceans 11 I have not seen the OG but I can attest to the Sodenboro trilogy as some of the sexiest, most engaging, fun times that you can ever have. It's funny too because I love all three of them. And honestly, I think Ocean's 13 is the best. But each, like, it, it, there are casts that you just don't get anywhere else. I mean, George Clooney, Matt Damon, uh, Andy Garcia, Brad Pitt, Julia Roberts. Catherine said Jones, Don Cheetah, uh, my God, like the list, Bernie Mac, Al Pacino in all of these films, like the list grows. And it's the kind of delicious film, which it has so much precision within the filmmaking, but you just can't have not an amazing time with it. You know, if you've never seen the Oceans films, again, uh, they directed Logan Lucky, which I love. It doesn't have that sort of edge to itself that 11, 12, and 13 do, but Sodenboro is a legend, constantly putting out films. These are incredible. You need to check them out. exhilarating and I think a lot of times people think it's too 
feels sort of self-indulgent, which I will admit, but people think his movies are structureless. I mean, Ryan Gosling essentially plays a character that rarely speaks the entire time, maybe 10 lines. But with all that being said, he still delivers, and I think it really was put on a full display with Blade Runner 2049. This movie is a revenge thriller set within, my god, where is it set? Japan. Bangkok, sorry. And, you know, it's, I think it's kind of, to me, one of the biggest examples of a film that does not hit you yet, but you kind of realize after the amount of time you've been thinking about it, that maybe it was a pretty damn good movie, and I think it's now become an excellent film for me. It's 88 minutes. 88 minutes. 90 minutes. And you could say a lot doesn't happen, but I think with maybe a lot of dissections that you research and find within yourself, you would figure out that that is not just the case. There's quite a lot that's packed in with this movie. Check it out. Next is a movie I promise you I will make a video on. Overlord, one of the biggest sleeper hits in a very, 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 very long time. It does a lot. It's a war film. It's a zombie film. It's a horror film. It's like a budget throwback to the 70s grindhouse. And all of them kind of work, in my opinion. It was so understated when it was released. 2018, a lot of people thought that this was like a Cloverfield tie-in with it being produced by J.J. Abrams. But it wasn't, doesn't deteriorate nor detract from the excellency on display. If you're a fan of smaller, action-heavy horror films, zombie films, body horror, it is your movie. Wyatt Russell in the film is great. The main actor, oh, I forget his name, but he's so good. Uh, I really cannot wait to see what Julius Avery, the director, does next, because that film is so much fun, set within Nazi-era Germany. I love it. I love it. The less you know, the better, but you get in love with these ragtag group of friends that have to work within their uh, squad, and it gets to crazier lengths as the movie progresses. Gotta watch it. Next, we have one of the best, Paddington 2. And you best believe I'll not forgive the person who brought this down from 100% on Rotten Tomatoes to a 99. The first Paddington I adore, and somehow this second one makes it even better. I got this at the Dollar Tree, another find that I'll cherish for the rest of my life. I love the movie so much. It was in this, like, edition that has, like, a little, like, children's booklet. And for real, like, I think children's movies are, yeah, of course, navigated towards children, but when done right and with as much love and care, there's, like, a prison sequence in the movie where Paddington goes to jail. And again, it feels like Wes Anderson where his style doesn't overshadow and Paddington is a staple. I really don't think the world would be the same without the bear. I freaking love it. And marmalade. Put me on marmalade. Bomb. You gotta have it. Next, we have David Fincher's Panic Room in a very small DVD. Um, it's kind of blowing my mind because at this present moment, I know they've kind of announced a Blu-ray in the works, but I mean, my God, this film came out in, what, 2004? It's been almost freaking 20 years, and this is all we gotta deal with, but the movie itself is a nail-biter for sure, a film that I cannot recommend enough. It's uh, like a home invasion film where Jodie Foster and her daughter hide away in a panic room. They just moved in, and the way that the movie is filmed and written really elevates the suspense in a way that by the end, you kind of don't even hate the people that are committing these acts because the script so balances um, equal and ample attention to Jodie Foster and her daughter, played by very young Kristen Stewart at the time, but it juggles so many great characters in a brief, isolated runtime. As Forrest Whitaker, Jared Leto, I love the movie. Check it out. It is a very young David Venture at work, but it doesn't detract from the craftsmanship. Next up, we have Paprika, Satoshi Kon, the man, the myth, the legend, one of the greatest anime filmmakers there is. This is the movie that 
inception. That's all you really need to know. Dream within a dream, trying to capture and plan ideas. It is dense. It is a tough watch, but one that I would inject into my veins time and time again. And if you've never seen Satoshi Kon's most popular film, Perfect Blue, please do yourself a favor and do that. It's so good. Next, we have Parasite. Not much else I could really add to the discourse. It very much deserves. I was surprised it got it, but it 100% deserved it. Best uh, foreign language film and best picture. It deserves all the acolytes and then some. Bong Joon-ho is honestly doing it in a way that nobody else ever will be. This is such an engaging thriller that has so much commentary that doesn't seem forced. It's all naturally fed. And another film that by the end, when the narrative comes to a full head, yeah, just yeah. I, I love the movie so much. Next, we have Passengers. So, Passengers is a very weird movie to me because I don't love it. I don't hate it. I think it really just comes down to my biggest gripe with the film being the fact that there is a certain plot thread that happens very early on in the movie that I think if weighted and structured differently, it could have resulted in an entirely different experience. But still, with that being said, it is a good movie. I mean, Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence are great. Um, I just wish it was structured differently to really maximize the effect that the film didn't even try to go for. What we got was good, but it couldn't, it could have very well been a different movie if one thing was switched, but I'm not going to spoil it because it kind of really ruins the entire film. Check it out if you haven't though. I don't own movies that I don't like. I enjoy it. Next, we have one of the smallest, cutest films, The Peanut Butter Falcon, starring Dakota Johnson and Shia LaBeouf with Zach Godson. Gotta... Godsagen, Godsagen. I'm so sorry if I butchered that, but I wanted to pronounce his name as best as I could because it is his first role, and it basically follows this young man, Zach. Uh, and it's funny because the actor's name is Zach, and I think just that in and of its I'll explain. He has Down syndrome and has always had this dream of becoming a wrestler. So when he breaks out of the home that he's in on search of finding his wrestling spirit, he comes into contact with Shia LaBeouf, who is just this wanderer of the world. And there, Dakota Johnson, who's essentially kind of the watcher over Zack, goes on this hunt for him. It's this sweet story of self-discovery, and I can't really implore enough, and it's the title, Peanut Butter Falcon. <laughs> It makes so much more sense when you watch it. I try and put everyone on it, and it's the perfect movie to watch when you're having a bad day, if you're kind of lost and aimless within what really is the purpose of being on this earth. This film will reaffirm that in spades. If you've never seen The Peanut Butter Falcon, I'm telling you, it will uplift your spirits so much. Now, with that said, I'm going to jump into a film that doesn't do that as much, Phantom Thread. Paul Thomas Anderson, again, I love the man, minus licorice pizza. Daniel day Lewis's last performance, oh my gosh, what is her name? Vicky Gripes. She started, I want to say, her massive real big break into the Hollywood zeitgeist through this movie. It's about a dressmaker by the name of Reynolds Woodcock who meets Almer, this waitress once at a diner, and he immediately is enamored by her, or is it her or body, you know, because he really loves to go fully into his dressmaking. He takes it as a serious profession as he possibly could, and they strike a very toxic relationship. I like to consider it like a Beauty and the Beast tale, but the way that Beauty Alma tames the Beast Reynolds, by the end, it turns to be one of the best love stories, and I think out of all of Paul Thomas Anderson's work, it's not my favorite, but I would argue it might be his best. He shot the film, directed, and wrote it. I love the movie, and it's the one that's probably grown to be one of his best uh, for years, so watch it. Next, though, as I was talking about with Mandy, Nicolas Cage has been a chameleon of an actor, and Michael Cernoski's big just so happens to be the film that I think 
is not only Nicolas Cage's best work, it's one of the finest films ever made within the past decade as it starts with Nicolas Cage playing a truffle hunter who gets his truffle hunting pig stolen. And that's very odd parameters to start a revenge, at once a revenge story, but it's the farthest thing from it. As you watch the movie and experience it, you realize it has so much more under its skin, and in 93 minutes, this movie packs a bunch because of Nicolas Cage's subtlety and what Michael Cernovsky as the director does with the narrative. I don't think there could have been a better movie that Nicolas Cage could have done at his age, at his trajectory as a performer. I did not expect a film about at once a truffle hunter trying to find his pig to be as deeply layered as it is. I've tried to put so many people on it, but it sounds insane for me to say it. Um, uh, but yeah, I did a video on it early on in my channel. I'm very proud of it because it deserves all the credit it can get and then some. Check out Pig if you haven't. Next up, we have Celine Siama's Portrait of a Lady on Fire, one of the greatest love stories ever, ever made. It is set, oh god, um, summoned, on it, I, I don't know exactly the time period it's set on, but it basically centers around a woman, a painter, who is tasked with painting a piece of one of the most revered women who is about to get married to one of the highest regarded men in the land. And this painting is really indicative of showcasing her beauty for what would be a matrimony and marriage between the man and herself. But this painter and the woman, the muse, strike a very beautiful relationship. I don't think there could possibly be a movie that'll strike you if you really let it then Portrait of a Lady on Fire. I believe it's on Hulu as well, but get the Criterion Collection if possible, because this is something you're going to want to own. Now next is a movie that at first, when I say that it is a film I've been wanting to make a video on for so long, you would scratch your head, what, Power Rangers? But I'm here to tell you, Power Rangers is directed by Daniel Israelite, Dean Israelite, I'm so sorry, and a movie that I'll be talking about, actually, <laughs> Less than a few minutes is a man that prioritizes the characters in a coming of age story above all else and i will never forgive the people who slept on this film when it came out and are now starting to realize its greatness because we could have gotten a freaking franchise it has dacry montgomery uh naomi scott rj kyler becky g as all of these characters i know i'm missing one I know I'm in, oh my god, I forgot the other guy's name, but this cast is fantastic. What I like to tell people is, it's a coming of age story for two thirds of it, and then it's a Power Rangers film, and honestly, the Power Rangers stuff might be its weakest element. These characters are all issues, and filled with so much going on within their heads, and it, I'm telling you right now, I could not have expected to care as much as I did about all of these groups of people, but the way that the movie is cared with and crafted, the opening is like a one minute, one take, and that's exactly what you need to know to know that there's so much precision within the filmmaking. It's egregious how slept on the 2017 Power Rangers film is, and I promise you I'll make a video on it. Next, we have the Predator 3 film feature with Predator. Predator 2 and the 2010 Predators. So Predator is one of the best 80s films to really get you understanding of the time period. Predator 2, not very good. It's set in New York. Haven't seen it in a very long time. Predators, very underrated, very underrated, starring Adrian Brody, and it ties to a lot of things new within the lore and universe of Predator, and I think it's the best sequel I did not like the Shane Black 2018 film, but Predator and Predator is very underrated. I love them. I love them. There's not much to say. The creature design of the Predator themselves is still to this day one of the greatest there is. It's a blast through and through. It's Arnold Schwarzenegger with body oil bathed onto him, for God's sake. Check it out. Now next, like I said, Daniel Israelite, Project Almanac last of a movie. It 
it's basically like a time travel high school film about this boy who sees his father's tapes and finds himself in his fourth birthday and i'm not talking about his four-year-old self i'm talking about his high school present self within his four-year-old birthday video and he spends that time trying to figure out who he is and why that happened along with his friends i love it so much you need to check it out now finally we have project x this is the last one within the second part video and i think it's the perfect reason because it's a blast you don't go to a movie like project x which depicts one of the biggest parties in the world that is loosely based on a true story for the plot you go in for the excitement the thrill the energy that is invoked and honestly i love the movie i mean i'm young i'm 19 so it's like I just turned 19 uh it's it's the kind of movie that i love and i think it's tailor-made for my demographic i don't know if it's gonna hold up it put me on a kid cutty it's a blast it, you sink your teeth into it with a group of friends having pizza some drinks and you let loose that movie is a blast and honestly what a perfect way to end this second part of the video we got about like two and a half more stacks left we can get through those like nothing we can take a little break but seriously i hope you've been enjoying this journey as i have been i've loved every second of it and i love you guys so much stay tuned for part three coming soon i love you all